Welcome to Mental Health Mini number 19, where we'll talk about neurocognitive disorders. To start off, a neurocognitive disorder is a disorder that causes changes in cognition and memory and can also impact different levels of functioning. They are often progressive and can be categorized as mild or major. Examples of major neurocognitive disorders include delirium, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, and prion-related disease. It can also be classified as either being primary, which means that the disorder is due to organic brain changes or diseases and not related to other illnesses, such as Alzheimer's, or it can be secondary, which is a cognitive disorder that develops as a result to another illness, such as in traumatic brain injuries or in HIV infections. Common risk factors for the development of neurocognitive disorders includes genetics, especially in relation to Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and Alzheimer's disease, having frontotemporal lobular de degeneration, having exposure to vascular diseases, Lewy body diseases, prion disease, HIV infection, traumatic brain injury, substance abuse, medications, and comorbid disorders. Symptoms of neurocognitive disorders are going to depend on which part of the brain is effective. Mostly though, we see impaired thought content, which can lead to limited abstract thinking, judgment and impulse control, hallucinations and delusions, poor focus and memory, and disorientation. Behaviorally, we often see inappropriate and uninhibited behaviors, poor ADLs, incontinence, and poor eating and or inability to eat due to dysphagia. We can see impaired socialization, aphasia, impaired speech, especially with minimal verbal communication or verbal tics. We can see personality changes, especially more towards an irritable or moody personality. And we can see changes in movement, which we call apraxia. When assessing someone with a neurocognitive disorder, we base it on symptomology, cause, and type. We will look at a health history, do a physical assessment, and a mental status exam for neurocognitive disorders. We can also do labs and diagnostics, mostly to rule out other causes. This may include urine sample, liver function tests, glucose testing, a BMP, thyroid testing, a drug panel, infectious disease rule outs, in a PET scan. The PET scan in particular may be effective in identifying Alzheimer's disease. This is an example of different things we would assess in the mental status exam for neurocognitive disorders. So we would assess their verbal fluency, their comprehension, and ask them to do different tasks, help them with naming and word finding, assess their orientation, assess their new learning ability, assess their immediate recall as well as long-term memory recall. We would assess their visual memory, their paired associative learning. We would assess their constructional ability by having them recreate a drawing. We would assess their ability to do calculations, their proverb interpretation, as well as their ability to identify certain similarities in objects. Common nursing problems for neurocognitive disorders includes impaired memory, changes in mental status or orientation, impaired ability to perform ADLs, depression, grief, anxiety, risk for falls, impaired movement, risk of harm to self or others, impaired communication, risk for trauma, and knowledge deficit. When we talk about specific dis neurocognitive disorder treatments, we can base this on different symptoms that the patient's having. For example, if they have poor balance, we can help them with improved balance and psychomotor functioning. We would wanna arrange the room so that there's no fall risk. So we would wanna make sure that there's no loose rugs, there's no cords that are in the way that they may not be able to see. We would wanna ensure that the room is clean and not cluttered. We would wanna make sure that the furniture is set up in a way that makes it easy for the patient to get around, especially if they're using assistive devices. We would wanna encourage use of de assistive devices. If they're in the hospital, we would want to make sure that their bed is low and locked and that their room is near the nursing station, possibly using fall um, precaution interventions as well. And we would wanna encourage the patient to use railings whenever possible. 
If the patient develops agitation, we would want to reorient them. We can use antipsychotic medications. We would want to use calm and empathetic communication. We can use something called doll therapy where the patient holds a doll or a stuffed animal, and that's been found to be really effective in reducing anxiety for individuals with neurocognitive disorders. We can do music therapy or movement therapy where we encourage dancing motions. And we can create a non-stimulating environment by reducing the sound, the lighting, and any excessive stimulation. For patients that experience disorientation, we can make sure that our clocks and calendars use large numbers. We would want to incorporate as many personal items and family and friends as possible within the room. And if possible, it's best to set up the hospital environment as close to their personal room as possible. We would want time appropriate entertainment in the sense that if we are playing music or a television show for the patient, that we're doing something that is relevant to their generation, their prior memories, and something that they enjoy. Again, we would want to promote a non stimulating environment. We can do reminiscent therapy, which is done a couple of different ways. We can have them look at different photos of their life and have them try and remember what was going on there and help them to um, be reoriented with their memories. We could also do that through the time appropriate entertainment as well. And then we wanna keep staff as consistent as possible. If we have a patient that engages in wandering behaviors, we want to allow them to pace and wander if it's a safe environment. If it's not a safe environment or if they're wandering into other patients' rooms or if they're trying to exit the unit, we would want to walk with the patient to redirect them back to their own room or a safer setting. We would want to encourage to continue a structured schedule and we would want to put signs out that label where different things are. So for example, a patient may be incontinent if they have neurocognitive disorders, but it may not be that they have the inability to go to the bathroom. It may be that they have a difficulty finding the bathroom. So if we put a sign on the bathroom labeling that, it may make it easier for that patient to find the bathroom, the room, or wherever they need to go. We would also wanna monitor any exits if the patient is at risk for wandering out. If they have impaired communication, we would want to communicate in a calm and therapeutic manner. We would wanna use simple words, make sure that their hearing aid is on and working, as well as any other sensory devices they may have, including eyeglasses, things like that. We would wanna speak slowly and distinctly and always facing the patient. We would never wanna approach the patient from behind or the side where they can't see us because we don't wanna startle them. We want our nonverbal communication to match our verbal communication. We can engage in therapeutic touch and also use alternative communication devices such as written communication, um, pictures, things like that. If the patient is experiencing psychosis, we want to use therapeutic communication, use medication management, make sure that their hearing aids are working and that their eyeglasses are on. We would want to reassure them of their safety and use distraction. As far as self-care deficits go, we want to use a structured schedule and allow them plenty of time to complete their ADLs. We would want to encourage one task at a time and keep their ADL routine as consistent in the hospital as what they do at home. Common medications used for neurocognitive disorders include cholinesterase inhibitors such as Dunapezil or Aricept, Rivastigmine or Exelon, or Galantamine or Razidine. We can use Namanda, antipsychotic medications, antidepressants, sleep aids, and anti-anxiety medications. Having a family member with neurocognitive disorders can be very distressing to family members, especially as that individual loses awareness of who that individual may be. Also, if the patient is aggressive or difficult to take care of. So we would want to educate the family on the progression of the disease, proper interventions for all of these different things we've talked about and supportive resources. We know that um, treatment is effective when the patient is free of injury, when they have maintenance of their orientation, if we can delay progression of symptoms, if they have improved ability or actual ability to perform ADLs as independently as possible, if the family and the patient show understanding of education, 
and if we have optimized their quality of life. And that summarizes just the basic overview of neurocognitive disorders.